Okay. What happened next? What happened next? We, I mentioned the election of FDR, Roosevelt, and he, he actually ran on an election platform of laissez-faire. He wasn't saying anything different from the Republicans, fundamentally. Uh, but coming into power, they started implementing the New Deal, being influenced by the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. And they injected $20 billion into the economy. They created all these. Uh, so they first things that first, they took care of the banks. And then they instituted all of these work programs to put the unemployed to work on so uh, on various products, uh, projects of, ve of various degrees of usefulness. Uh, and, and this did have an effect. This did have an effect. It stopped the deflation. It stopped the bank crisis. And and there was a temporary boom. There's a temporary b boom from 1933 to 1937. But, uh, and, and, and Trotsky analyzed what was the New Deal. Uh, in, in his writings on fascism, he said that the New Deal was, it was essentially the, the response to the crisis in the imperialist countries, which had a bit more fat on their bonds. That in Italy and Germany, who, uh, yep, Germany especially, who'd been defeated in the First World War, uh, went through uh, you know, several decades of total crisis, there was no fat left. And the only road forward for the bourgeois at that time was fascist reaction to stop the possibility of revolution. But the American ruling class that had uh, fat in the bones, rather than risking civil war, a, an out and out murderous struggle against the working class, they decided to expend some of that fat to buy class peace. And, and so, so the New Deal is the, uh, the imperialist interpretation of the response uh, that Germany led to fascism. But Trotsky also explained how it didn't work. It didn't work and it could not work. It is merely just a shot of adrenaline in the arm of a, uh, of a sick person that it may give you a burst of energy for a period, but eventually that stimulant will wear off. And, and that's why it, it gave a brief burst from 33 to 37 before the, the economy headed back down again, because the fundamental crisis had not been solved. And in fact, despite pumping in $20 billion. Don't, don't forget the, uh, the economy of the United States at the time was something like uh, only $57 billion. So it's, it's a huge amount. Uh, that recovery created profits, but did not lead to any sort of productive cycle of capital accumu accumulation. And the new slump in 37 actually started from a height 10% below 1929. So they did not even get back to 1929. And there is this idea that the New Deal, a reformist idea, that the New Deal is what solved the Great Depression. That is not what happened. And I'll come back to it later, explaining how they actually got out of this crisis. Now, turning to Canada, that you had, uh, at the beginning of the Great Depression in 1929, you had William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was the Prime Minister, Liberal, the son of William Mackenzie, the leader of the Upper Canada Rebellion in, 1930, oh, in 1837. So he come, came from radical revolutionary pedigree, but he was a terrible liberal bourgeois prime minister and believer in laissez-faire. But uh, again, he ignored, he, he tried to say, you know, the, oh, the, what cri crisis? What crisis? The fundamentals are sound. In fact, every while the stock market crash was going on. That was the mantra by everybody. Politicians, investors, businessmen. Fundamentals are sound. Fundamentals are sound. Fundamentals are sound. Fundamentals were not sound. The, condition, the uh, society was sitting on a precipice. 
just waiting to fall over the edge. And it was falling over the edge. But all the politicians would say fundamentals were sound. Well, Mackenzie King got kicked out on the basis of that. And the Conservatives under Bennett were elected. Uh, but they were both committed to balanced budgets, laissez-faire. Uh, and, and in Canada, you've got the rather bizarre constitutional arrangement between federal government, the national government, the provincial government, municipal governments. And you've got this bizarre division of powers in the, Fe in the Canadian Federation. And so the federal government under Mackenzie King and Bennett said, no, 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 welfare is a provincial and a, and a municipal responsibility. We have got no responsibility for that. And actually both the Liberals and the Conservatives rejected New Deal, they rejected Keynesianism and, and insisted on balanced budgets. Actually, in fact, it's an astounding statistic that over the period of the Great Depression, the Canadian government spent more money servicing the debt of the Canadian National Railway than it did on unemployment support. So they did next to nothing. And combined with this, there was a huge victimization of the poor. A saying that if you're not working, if you're unemployed, it's your fault, it's a failure of character, a total victimization. Uh, there's actually quite a good quote from uh, Bennett on this, uh, that uh, you know, he was in Vancouver and uh, various provincial and municipal politicians were saying to him, look, you've got to give us some support. And he responded quite angrily. If you want to know who is responsible for all this debt, look at yourself in the mirror when you are shaving tomorrow. Where is the spirit of our pioneers who tilled our soil and worked our forests? Did they go to government whenever they wanted anything? They did not ask government to be a wet nurse to every derelict. And th this was the totally callous attitude. You know, how could you explain, you know, there's, there's 25, 30% unemployment and that, that, that's just a failure of these individuals. It's clearly systemic, very clearly systemic, but they utterly refused to do anything about it and demonized uh, the working class that was made unemployed by the crisis of the system. It's quite an interesting book. It's written by a liberal, uh, Pierre Burton, a Canadian historian who wrote a book called The Great Depression uh, about uh, the impact of this in Canada. And, and he's got some quite astounding stories of uh, just what it meant, just what this poverty really meant, what this unemployment really meant. Because there's always a danger in discussing these things. You can get caught up in these statistics but these statistics are people. These statistics are real human relations. And one story he told was a family from Saskatchewan and they were butchers. And they ran a butchers in their town in Saskatchewan and depression happened and it failed. So a couple, young boy, nine year old. So they moved to Vancouver on the West Coast to try and make a go of it there in 1930. They started up a new butcher's shop. But in the period of like, after about six months, that shop collapsed. But here they're stuck because welfare is a municipal responsibility, but they haven't been living in Vancouver long enough to qualify for welfare. So they're stuck, they've lost their business, they've got no money, and they'd have to get back to their home to get, even get welfare to survive. Eventually a charity gave them a one-way ticket to go back home. But they're totally distraught, totally, you know, with the, with the victimization, with the, with this, with the, uh, the idea of failure. So they gather together the last of their money and they rent a car and they find a barn a discard, you know, a disused barn, and they run a pipe from the the exhaust into the car. There's many. This is this is just one story of many. There are many, many suicides from this period. But it gets worse. So they gave the boy something to eat, something to read. 
uh, and, they, and they turned on the gas, but they didn't have enough money for uh, enough, enough gas. So when they, they, and they ended up waking up in the morning. They woke up in the morning, the little boy was dead, but they still lived and totally distraught. They tried to uh, end it all. They tried to hit each other and cut each other, but they were too weak. Eventually they were discovered and arrested for murder. But the, uh, the jury refused to convict, refused to convict them, said that the real guilty party was the depression. And this is, this is what we talk about, you know, when Engels talked about social murder, social murder, these are the, these are the real deaths that capitalism produces. Deaths of the crisis, deaths of the depression, but also deaths of the system, deaths of the victimization of, po of the poor. These are the real human stories, the real human repercussions of this disgusting anti-human system. And this is why we fight it. And we, and we need to know not just the statistics, but also the human side of things, because we are fighting for a better, a socialist world where people run things for need and not for profit. Now, mass unemployment and mass homelessness. You got the, uh, the occurrence of what was known as hobo villages, communities of homeless people who would uh, gather together to look after each other. They'd beg, borrow, steal, whatever, scraps of food they, they could find. They'd throw it all in a big pot and share it out to eke out an existence. In fact, uh, I live in Toronto and I live just uh, by the, uh, the Don Valley, the River Don in Toronto. And back in the 1930s, there was quite a large hobo village uh, right there. And I was on a walk along the same river just uh, the other day. And what did you see? A whole bunch of tents from today's hobo village, today's homeless people. So we're facing almost exactly the same situations. Uh, so you've got these develops of these Village, hobo villages, mass homelessness, but you also had this concept of riding the rails that people, rather than be stuck in their uh, existing terrible conditions, would decide on making their luck throughout the country. It's not as if they're going to buy a train ticket. They don't have the money for that or anything like that. What they do is jump on to a train car on, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a car that would be carrying grain or other such commodities. At its height in Canada, there was 100,000 people riding the rails. So this wasn't a small thing. This was a mass phenomenon. And it was very dangerous that you could be knocked off that if you're sitting on the top, you could be knocked off when it goes through a tunnel. In winter, people froze to death that uh, uh, if you were between two cars, if the brakes stopped suddenly, you'd be crushed between two cars. Or this was all illegal. So sometimes the cops would lock the doors of the carriages and then people would get locked inside and starve. So, but people still did this. They still did this. They made their luck and they, they begged, borrowed and stole. And maybe if they were very lucky, found some, some work somewhere. But uh, this was a whole way of life in the 1930s. The, this uh, itinerant population, largely young, predominantly male, the government became very, very afraid. They saw the, this young population with no hope as a potential spark for revolution. Maybe they weren't wrong. And out of this came an idea, well, we can't have them just begging on the streets or riding the rails around the country, spreading a disorganization and revolution. We've got to take them away and put them in work camps, otherwise known as slave camps. And these were run by the military. A guy called General McNaughton was the instigator of the, the work camps in Canada. 
and uh, and these yeah they were run by the military and uh, not fully military discipline but not far off it and and this was presented uh, there was the propaganda of the time oh this is great young men going off do something good for the country and uh, you know uh, comradeship and all the rest of it total propaganda no relation to reality that uh, and, and they were given useless work dig a hole one day fill it up the next you know, and, and other things that weren't much better than that people were you know 88 uh, workers uh, were crammed into a shack a single toilet that didn't flush utterly disgusting conditions uh, they were given 20 cents a day uh, pocket money so uh, and even by those standards of the 1930s this was just an insult uh, they they passed a regulation that those in the camps couldn't vote in the constituency of the camp they had to vote in their home constituency but they weren't allowed to leave so effectively they've been disenfranchised from the vote uh, there was no uh, right to free speech or right to organization anybody who uh, issued any petition or grievance or anything like that was immediately kicked out and, and you ask yourself okay well and, and they made the point that oh nobody's forced to be here it's voluntary to come in and it's voluntary to leave yeah it's voluntary to leave but if you do leave you are blacklisted and you're ineligible to, for welfare so you can't get a job and you can't get any support so you're going to starve actually not just that if you end up begging on the streets you're arrested for vagrancy so no it wasn't once you're in there was no free choice to get out uh and uh, and so th this was a you know a huge point of conflict all these young people forced into these slave camps 